For me, code does three things. It digitizes work, it automates the work, and it can scale up the work. So I'm gonna talk about automation. If I searched for like something like automation or auto automation code, right? You would get automation testing, okay? If I simply search for automation for code or something like that, I would get automation testing as one of the results. Here's what I think automation really is. First, you learn to code in something like Python, and then you apply that code to do some kind of work. For example, collecting stock market data or collecting some digital asset data and then coding some trading strategy based on the price of the data. So the code is automatically sifting through hundreds of stock prices that a normal human can do within seconds and then it applies the trading strategy which you've coded automatically. So this to me is the essence of automation. Okay, all you need to know is how to query their APIs, how to query their database through your Python code. So this is the essence of automation for me. Okay, so you have some code that does some work. To make sure that the code continues to work, you write another code and this code is the test code, okay? The test code makes sure that the main code continues to work. If the main code stops working, the test code rings the alarm and some real people, or maybe in the future AI, can fix the issue. When you're testing the main code, you're checking for two things mainly. You're checking that the main code is error-free and you're also checking that the main code's logic is correct. Error messages can be generated on the terminal itself. That's not an issue, but the computer won't be able to figure out if the logic is correct. Okay, so you have to write code that checks that the logic is correct. You can also write tests for many other purposes. You can test the code against different versions, against different browser versions, Python versions, uh, different inputs. So there's different things that you can test against. But the main thing is you're checking that the test is error free and that the logic of the code is correct. Okay, you have to do this yourself. And if you write code that does this and you schedule that code, this is automation testing. Okay, you know why tests are needed. Why do you need a testing framework like PyTest? So basically, the reason for using PyTest is the features itself that PyTest gives you. All these features that PyTest gives you makes testing more easier. Whenever you're testing code, you will come across having to do one of these features, right? It's a staple in testing. So would you rather code this stuff from the ground up or would you rather just use it out of the box from PyTest itself? It'd be a better idea to use the features from PyTest. So all these tools that PyTest gives you are the reasons for why you would want to use the framework itself because they are a staple in the testing process. So that's it for the introductory material. We can now get started with the code. We need to set up the lab and then we can actually do some work with the code. I hope you guys are ready. Before we get into the more valuable stuff, I just wanted to make a quick video just to say that if you haven't taken a Udemy course before or you haven't taken one recently, I just want you to know that Udemy asks for review very early on in the course. 
So you may not have really gotten all the valuable content at that point and really seen what a five star experience really is. I just want you to know that if they do ask you for a review, just hang on a little bit and wait till you've gotten all the good stuff, all the valuable stuff out of this course before you leave a review. I really do appreciate the positive reviews. So yeah, once you've done a little more of the course and you've decided to stop or leave for the first time, please do leave a rating. Um, you can do that from your lecture dashboard on the top right over here. It's right next to your progress. Hit leave a rating and you want to rate the course um, whatever you think the quality of this course is. If you feel that this is a above your expectation course, I would really appreciate the positive feedback. And if you feel like you haven't gotten a five star review, please just reach out to me in a personal message. Maybe I can answer some personal questions or point you to a later lecture in the course that answers the question for you. But either way, if you can leave a positive review, I totally appreciate that. So anyway, yeah, I just wanted to say that please wait till you've gotten the really valuable stuff out of this course before leaving that feedback. Right, so that's it. Let's get back into the good stuff. Since I'm doing work in the Linux operating system, for those of you who are using the Windows operating system, I wanted to show you guys how to run Linux inside your Windows operating system. For this, we're going to use a virtualization software. This is the software that will run Linux inside the Windows operating system. So go into your browser, search for VirtualBox, this is the virtualization software. Click on the first link, it's virtualbox.org. And then click on the big blue button, can't miss it. And then you want to select Windows hosts, okay? Because we're using Windows operating system. Okay, the download is complete. Okay, the second thing that we need to download is the Linux software itself. So we're going to download a particular distribution of Linux called Kali Linux and we're going to install the virtual the virtual box image right exactly this one here right the guest VM so it's at Kali.org and then you want it inside virtual box so VirtualBox can run two kinds of files. It can run the .iso file, which is a disk image, right? You can take the Linux software, you can take that file and burn it onto a disk. And you can install Linux from that disk if you want. You can also run it directly on your laptop as well. The other kind of file that VirtualBox can run is the virtual box image file. So this is a file specifically designed to run in virtual box. Okay, so Linux will run directly on virtual box. The reason why a virtual box image file is so great is because if you're using the other kind of file, you have to, you know, the .iso file which you can burn onto a disk. If you use that file, you need to install Linux when you run it, okay, using the VirtualBox software. Whereas if you're using the VirtualBox file in the VirtualBox software, you don't have to install Kali Linux, okay? You just need to run Kali Linux inside the VirtualBox and it'll immediately run. You don't have to boot it inside the VirtualBox software. What you wanna do is click on this link over here and here you have the Kali Linux, VMware, and VirtualBox images. So we want VirtualBox, that's 64. This is the one I think. Yeah, this is the one. So we're gonna click on that and the file is being downloaded. 
So we have the software which will run our Linux operating system and we have the Linux operating system as well. If you want to follow some sort of documentation, you can go back and here you have all the steps that you need to follow. I'm going to click on the top right icon and select virtual box. And we're going to start installing. Click on next, click on next, click on next. Yes. Install. So fairly straightforward all of this, isn't it? The installation for VirtualBox is complete, so we can click on finish and we can start VirtualBox. Awesome. Now we need to run Linux inside this VirtualBox. So uh, let's just check out the file that we downloaded, right? So go into uh, this file explorer and if you go into downloads, these are the two files that we downloaded. Okay, so this is the Kali Linux operating system. Well, it's the zip file. Right, so we need to extract this zip file. So this file contains our files. So we need to extract the files from inside this file. And here is the progress for that. So let's add that image, click on add, go into downloads, go into the folder and this is the file that we are going to be working with, click on open and there you have it. So here you can click on this button over here or you can click on settings to tweak how the operating system works. So I'm going to click on settings. In the advanced tab, you want to make sure that these two settings are in bi-directional. If you go into system, here you want to set how much RAM you want to use. I'm going to leave it at 2 GB. You want to make sure the processors is at number 2. And that's about it. Go into display, you want to make sure the video memory is set to max. You don't want to enable 3D accel acceleration. And I think that's about it. You can click on OK and you can click on Start to start the operating system. You have a new window opening. We're going to click on View and set this to full screen. And it doesn't look like it's got into full screen. So maybe we need to just proceed normally. Hit Enter. Okay, it's prompting us for a username and a password. So let's minimize this, go into the documentation and just Google what the username and password for VirtualBox is. And we can see that the username is Kali and the password is also Kali. Let's go here. The username is Kali and the password is also Kali. Hit enter. Awesome. So now we're in Kali Linux. And there we have it. This is our operating system. This is the Kali Linux operating system. It's mainly a penetration testing operating system. So if you click on the top left over here, you can see all these use cases for which you use the operating system. So if we're doing information gathering, you can click on that and you'll have all these applications that help you in information gathering. I don't use it for penetration testing. I mainly use it because it's the only VirtualBox image that is maintained by some group out there. And it happens to be the Kali Linux group, maintaining the Kali Linux image. If you've never worked with a virtualization software before, you've just made a huge leap forward. You can now run Linux operating systems inside your Windows operating system. For doing our work, we're going to be using the terminal. Okay, so this black icon over here is the terminal emulator. We can achieve the things that we want to do by typing stuff into the terminal. Okay, so if I want to update, you need to type sudo 
sudo space update sudo stands for super user and then the command which is update now if I hit the enter key this command will execute the problem is that this process takes a long time the reason is the computer that we're connecting to is a computer that is maintained by Kali Linux somewhere out there in the world we're connecting to that computer and we're trying to obtain some files in order to update our computer the issue is that everybody in the world is pinging the same server the same computer so what we want to do is find other servers that Kali Linux maintains so that maybe those other servers are a lot more faster because there are less people accessing that computer so we're going to go into Firefox you can click on Firefox over here on the top we're going to search for so you want to search for something called mirror script v2 and you want to click on this first link over here called Kali mirror script v2 by Iceman and what you want to do is download this file here called mirror script v2.py I'm going to just click on this green button over here and um, yeah just download the zip file for now we're going to save the file okay and we're going to show the downloads in the folder here is our file we're going to right click oh, okay so I'm gonna have to right click over here open the containing folder so here's the folder I didn't need to do that okay so we opened the file inside of downloads you can open it by clicking on this down arrow over here or okay no you can click on this folder icon on the top left I know it's very very small I'll fix that very soon I promise you go into downloads and you click on open folder right and you have your file okay so right click on the file mirror script v2 and let's see if we can yeah extract over here and you have the mirror script file here right so we want this Python file here I'm going to right click and see if I can open in the terminal so now I have opened the terminal but this time the location that I've opened it in is inside of in this area right so if I type uh, ls for list you can see all the files okay so to run a Python file you type Python and then you type the name of the Python file and then you hit the tab key right to autocomplete you can hit tab to autocomplete if I hit the enter key it will execute this Python file and it's saying that I need to run as the root or sudo so you need to type sudo python m-i-r-r-o-r -R -R, hit the tab key to autocomplete and hit the enter key now it asks for a password which is Kali and now what it does is it's trying to search for other Kali Linux maintained computers to connect to which don't have a lot of traffic this will make updating my Kali Linux super fast okay I know this is really really mind-boggling stuff but I promise you this is so so important it's going to make your life a whole lot more easier and now it's for the time of truth you want to type sudo update and if you hit the enter key this will not take it's not sudo update it's sudo apt update okay and hopefully this thing doesn't take too much time and that's it it took barely 15 to 30 seconds for this command to complete if you didn't do the steps that I did before this step would normally have taken five minutes but over here it now took us only 15 seconds okay so now from this point forward uh, if you ever type sudo apt update it's barely gonna take you know a second or two now 
Okay, so a big, huge improvement. The next step is to upgrade. Okay, so sudo apt upgrade. Now, this will take quite a while because it needs to download one gigabyte of data. And then on top of that, it needs to install this data as well. So just hit Y and hit enter. And this is going to take a while, so I'm going to pause the recording. In between, you are going to get prompts on the terminal, like this one here. What you want to do is hit the tab key. Okay, just select the terminal and hit the tab key. That will highlight the OK text and then you hit enter. Restart services during package upgrades without asking. I'm going to set this to no. Hit enter and some more text. Hit tab, enter. Hit enter. The upgrade is complete. That took quite a lot of time. So be warned. Hit enter. Okay, so we updated, then we upgraded, and now we want to install the GNOME Desktop Manager. The GNOME Desktop Manager is a visual interface, which is quite different from what we have here. And it's got a lot of features behind it. Just one feature actually, which is the search function, which I use a lot throughout the course. So I'm going to install that. To install GNOME Desktop Manager, you want to do sudo apt install kali dash desktop dash gnome. Hit enter. The password is Kali. Prompts you for whether you want to continue. I'm going to hit Y and hit enter. The terminal prompts you with some text. We're going to hit tab and hit enter. And now you want to select which display manager you want to use. Do you want to use LightDM, which is what we're using right now? Or do you want to use GDM3, which stands for GNOME Desktop Manager 3? So hit enter. Okay, I use the up arrow key to select the uh, GDM3 option. Now this might take a bit of time. We're done with the installation. That took quite a while. So let's clear the screen and reboot our virtual operating system. And hopefully the changes take place. You can see that the way Kali Linux is being presented to us is different now. So we've changed the graphics user interface. And that's why this is happening. So let's click on Kali because that's the username. And then type Kali again, which is the password. Okay, now that you've installed Linux, I want to show you how you can do work inside of Linux. Okay? You can open any program using the Windows key. So it opens up a search bar and I can type in anything I want to find inside my operating system. So if I want to search for, let's say the browser, which is Firefox, right? It auto completes the Firefox. It it does the auto completion, and I can just press the Enter key, and that opens up Firefox for me. Okay, so it's not just browsers. I can also search for, let's say, um, if I want a screen recorder, right? So just hit the Windows key and just type screen. Yeah. So these are the programs that start with screen. Like you have screenshot. And then you have the simple screen recorder, which is the program I'm using right now to record uh, my videos. Okay, 
and you can search for let's say if I want uh, stuff related to uh, my Wi-Fi do I have anything no so if you installed Ubuntu the search feature is far more better um, than the operating system I'm using here okay and if I want to go into settings right so it opens up the settings right and I can tap through each option over here so just hit the tab key and I can tap through all these settings hit the enter key and that opens up my settings okay so let me just close this out okay so the first shortcut that you can use for opening any program is the Windows key okay the next thing is controlling your browser okay through shortcuts so now browsers are a part of everybody's everyday life and so um, learning how to control your browser through shortcuts is also uh, really really useful so if I want to query anything to the browser I probably want to type stuff inside the address bar and so to um, type stuff in the address bar simply press Control L and now you can type stuff into this so how do I how to how to close browser or okay uh, shortcut for closing browser so that gives me a web page and I can move up and down the web page using the space key if I want to move down and if I want to move up I can use the shift space okay so it moves up and down frame wise so let's say that um, I'm done reading this part of the frame I can move down a frame by pressing the space key okay and then if I'm done reading this part of the frame I can move down a frame again using the space key if I want to move back up a frame it's shift space right so this takes getting used to Right, so uh, the Windows key was the first shortcut. Control L to type stuff in the address bar was your second was your second shortcut. And uh, moving up and down the browser by pressing the space key and then shift space for moving back up. Okay, so now the final one is closing your browser and it's already given over here. It is Control W, okay? So Control W for closing this window. And it's not just this window, any window can be closed using Control W. And if it doesn't close with Control W, it's Control Q. And the letter Q is located right next to W. Okay, so that's how you can do uh, some of the things, uh, some of the work inside of Linux um, using shortcuts. Okay, now I believe that uh, you can be very, very efficient in doing your work through shortcuts because you don't have to take your hands off the keyboard. Now, as we go through the course, I might add a few more shortcuts um, to help you become a little more efficient so that the work is a little bit more seamless. But these are the most important shortcuts. Okay. Now I want to talk about remapping some of the uh, keys on your keyboard to help you execute your shortcuts with ease. Okay, The most important shortcut was the Windows key and the next most important shortcut would be Control plus, you know, whatever. So the Windows key and the Control key are very, very important for doing work. But reaching these keys is really painful okay so to avoid the stretches right if I have to reach for the control key with my left hand I need to do a, um, a pinky stretch to the left bottom corner and that is a really painful stretch likewise to reach for the Windows key on the with my left hand I'd have to fold my thumb inwards because it's located uh, one key after the space bar to the left side there's an alt key next to my space bar on the left side and then after that alt key is my windows key so I need to fold my thumb inwards to the left side 
So to avoid these stretches, I recommend remapping your keys. So to do that, you first want to install uh, genome tweaks. So let's open up the terminal. So hit the Windows key and type terminal, TRM terminal. And it's the second one over here. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to tab into the second option and press enter. And this is my terminal. Now for complete newbies, um, the terminal is how you install programs inside of Linux. In this tutorial, we'll be doing all our installing of programs through the terminal. Whether that's installing normal programs or whether that's installing programs to help us um, write our Python code. You'll be doing all of that inside the terminal. That's all you gotta um, keep in mind for now. So, we're going to be installing genome tweaks. Okay, so sudo, which is, which means we're going to install as the super user, as in as the admin apt, which is a library that contains the install command. And then the install command, which is the command to install a program. And the program that we're going to install is genome dash tweaks. Press the enter key and it'll prompt you for a password. Okay, so Genome Tweaks is already installed in my laptop. While you're running this, it might prompt you whether you want to continue the installation, in which case you just tap the Y key and then press enter. Okay, and it will finish the installation. So you should have Genome Tweaks installed now. Now we can open up uh, Tweaks. So tap the Windows key, type Tweaks and you should have the tweaks icon up here. Just press the enter key. And now we are going to modify our key bindings, right? We're going to remap the keys. So to do that, it is in keyboard and mouse. And we want to make sure that your overview shortcut is the left super key. And then you click on additional layout options. So, what are uh, the layouts that I've done here? So, there are two things that I've done. The first thing is I've remapped the control key and I've also remapped the windows key. So, the first one is the control key. What I've done is I've swapped the control key and the caps lock key. Something that you can also do is convert the caps lock key as the control key. Okay. in which case you won't have a caps lock key. So the caps lock key is my control key. So now my stretch is only towards the left. I don't have to do a bottom left uh, stretch with my left pinky. So that's the first swap. The second swap is the windows key and I'm swapping the windows key with the alt key. So my left alt, which is right next to my space bar is now the windows key. Okay, so these are the two alterations that I recommend that you do on your Linux machine. So now if you have taken my advice and done the remapping, I want you to know that every time I say control, it's going to be the caps lock key. And if I'm going to say windows, tap on the windows, you're going to tap on the alt key. Okay. Okay, so that's it. Let's move on. We're going to install some uh, programs that are necessary for continuing with this tutorial. So let's install those necessary programs. The first thing that we're going to have to install is pip. So I want you to hit the windows key and then type term and then press the enter key. You want to select terminal. Okay, so make sure it's on terminal. If it's not, then just tab into uh, reaching the terminal, press the enter key and it opens up the terminal in order to install pip. You want to uh, sudo apt install pip and then you enter your password and for me it's already installed 
but for you guys it's probably going to uh, prompt you whether you are sure about installing so just hit the y key and then press enter and that's it so that's how you install pip the second thing that you want to install you know the place that we're going to create our code i'm going to be using uh, visual studio code so let's so make sure you hit the windows key one more time open up your browser firefox hit enter Control L to type inside the address bar and I'm going to search for just type VS code click on the very first link over here and because we're on Linux you probably want to install the .deb file so click on .deb and you have a file called .deb it's kind of like your exe file your executable file in Windows but in Linux, it's .deb. It ends with the extension is .deb. So click on Save File. Click OK. And I'll be back after this thing gets downloaded. All right, the file is finished downloading. Um, right click over here, open the containing folder. So here is my file, which I downloaded in my downloads folder. If I want to run this .deb file, just uh, right click on the file and then uh, click on install or something like that in your Ubuntu. I'm on Kali Linux. So I'm going to show you a way that is universal. So right click on this window somewhere and then click on open in terminal. And so that opens up a terminal inside the downloads directory. So let me just uh, close out the windows. So it's a bit more clear. Okay, so we're in the terminal in the downloads directory. So to install that .deb file, we're going to sudo, as in the super user, and then we're going to do dpkg-i, and then the name of the file. And I believe it was code something, so code tab, and it'll autocomplete. Okay, so press the enter key, and now you just enter your password. And now you give it some time, okay? It's gonna take two to three minutes for it to set up. So yeah, just have, just be a bit patient. All right, our program is installed. So now I can open up VS Code. You just have to tap on the Windows key and then type VS and there we have it, Visual Studio Code. Okay, so something that you wanna do here is go into settings, click on settings. And I'm going to increase the font size to maybe 16. And that's the only setting that I'm going to change here. I am also going to install the support for Python. So click on that. And it will reload after installing the additional. So just click on OK. Click on OK and that will run in the background. OK. The first thing you want to do is create a folder in which we're going to do our work. So we're going to open up our terminal by hitting the Windows key and then typing term. Press enter and we have our terminal open. Okay, we are right now, if I type pwd, it'll list out which directory I'm currently in and that is home slash lab. Okay. If I press ls, it'll list out all the folders in my home directory. And I'm now going to create a new directory, which is a new folder called projects. Okay, so it creates, it creates a folder called projects. And now I'm going to go into that folder by doing CD projects. CD is short for change drive. So I'm going into the projects directory. 
And now I'm inside projects directory, which is denoted by tilde slash projects. Tilde is home directory slash projects. Okay, so now I'm inside my projects folder. Okay, so my projects folder is going to house all my different projects for my different clients. So if I'm working for, let's say, in a company, and my comp and Google is a client of my company, so then I would probably create a folder specifically for my client, which is um, Google Projects, right? Right, and inside this, I would have all my code and I would have the tests for my code. Okay, so now, so that's one of my clients. Let's assume I have another client that my company uh, has and that would be probably Amazon. Okay, so um, a guy can only dream, right? Which is what we're gonna do. We're gonna imagine that, you know, Google and Amazon are our um, clients. So, I'll make DIR Amazon projects. Okay, so let's just clear the screen. These folders are the places where I'm going to do my work, okay? So let's move into one of these folders. Let's go into Google Projects. So I can do that by doing CD, which is change drive into Google. Um, and I can just press tab to auto complete it and press the enter key. And now I'm inside my Google Projects folder. Okay, so what is my folder arrangement gonna be like for doing my work? Okay, so the folder arrangement inside the place that you're doing your work will depend on whether your test is a white box test or a black box test. So what does that mean? It means do you have access to your code that you are testing. If you have access to the code that you're testing, it is white box testing, okay? And in that case, you know, you can have a folder for your code and you can have a folder for your tests, right? You have the test file and you have the code file. In black box testing, you probably don't have access to the code, right? So you don't have the code file but you still have to write the tests, right? So you have the test file, right? So let's assume that um, in the Google projects, we have access to the code, right? We are developing our own code, so we have access to the code. Therefore, it is white box testing. And the folder arrangement will be, um, you have a code folder, so you have a um, folder for your code, and you also have a folder that contains your tests, okay? If on the other hand, um, let's say for Amazon, right? So let's go into the Amazon projects folder. Okay, so now we're inside the Amazon so for the Amazon projects folder, if we don't have access to the code, then we only need to create the test folder, right? Because we don't have access to the code, right? So we can't even house it inside our um, laptop. Okay. And so at the end of the day, you have only a test folder that contains your test files. That's gonna hit probably a website or an API whose code you have no access to. Okay, so we just have one more folder to create. And this folder is going to house all our dependencies. And by dependencies, I mean Python itself. So for your code and your test to both run, you need Python. And it can't run without Python. So that means that Python is a dependency and you want to store that dependency in this file that we're going to create. 
Another thing that's a dependency is the libraries that you import into your Python code. For example, the requests library. It's a library that contains programs that allows you to work with websites. So all you have to do is install requests and then import it into your code so that you can create pro so that you can work with websites without having to um, write the code from scratch. But if you do import requests, it means that the requests library is a dependency, right? And so that means that whatever you pip install, right? Pip install requests is how you install requests. Whatever you pip install needs to be stored in this folder as well. So, your, uh, so the first thing you gotta realize about this folder that we're gonna create is you're putting your dependencies. And the second thing that you gotta realize about this folder is it's a special folder, okay? We're going to isolate this folder from the system files. It contains the files required for the code and the tests to run. So you don't want anything to interfere with your code. For example, if you have your code made in Python 3.8, Python 2 files can interfere with Python 3. There is a possibility that your system files could interfere with the files that are helping your code to run. So to prevent that from happening, you completely isolate your folder. So there are two tools that allow us to do exactly this, isolate our folder. Um, and that is VENV and TOX. I'll be covering VENV because um, the workflow is a bit more easier to understand, but TOX is the professional way to, you know, uh, creating isolated environments. It's more powerful. VENV is a tool that is provided from Python itself. So you install it via the Python that is already available in your system. So um, if you type which Python, it will tell you where your Python is installed and if it doesn't show anything, if it shows something else, it, it means that you don't have Python installed and you probably want to do sudo apt install Python. Okay. Okay, so we have a Python installed inside of user slash bin slash Python. What version of Python are we running? We are running Python dash dash version. We can type this and we get the Python version, which is Python 2.7. This is my default Python version. But I in fact have other versions as well. If I want to check that out, I can use the ls command. If I use ls on its own, you get, um, you list out the directories in the directory that you're in right now. So I'm right now inside of the projects folder. So it lists out the folders inside of projects. But if I did something like ls and then I passed in this location, right? So that would be slash user slash bin slash Python and then I put a star. So what this does is it will list all the files that begin with Python and follow with anything else, okay, whatever comes after this. So it'll list all the files starting with Python and ending with whatever. Um, and it should be located within this directory, right? And if I press enter, it'll list all the files that start with Python and end with whatever. So it's a way of listing out all your Python versions. So I have 2.7 and 3.9, okay? And by default, I've got 2.7 enabled. Okay, so let's just clear the screen. So VENV is a Python module. So you run VENV by typing Python, and then you type the version, which is 3.9, dash m and then vnv and so what this command does is it creates an isolated folder with the python 3.9 installed inside of it so the folder location will be inside of the home directory i'm going to create a folder called 
my ends. My ends is a folder that is going to contain all the environments, all the separate environments for every single project that I do. And it's all going to be different. Okay, so it's going to house all the environments. And the environment that I'm going to create is um, Google Project Environment. Okay, Google, you know what, I'll write it. Okay, you got to name it in a way such that you can remember which project this thing was made for, this environment is created for. So I just hit enter and it will create the isolated folder. Okay, so it's done creating that folder for me. I can now ls, okay, let's go to the home directory, cd tilde to go to the home directory. If I do ls now, we're going to cd into my ends, okay. And inside of that, I have my isolated folder. Okay, so I created, so if you go back to this first line over here, I was able to create a parent folder and within that parent folder, I created my isolated folder, okay, in one line of code. Okay, so what is inside of my isolated folder? So let's go inside, hit the tab key, and if I ls it. So these are the files that are installed when you install Python 3.9 and that's basically what you have over here, right? If I go into bin, if I go into the bin directory, this, this, this folder here, right? It's got quite, it's got this activate file over here and I'll show you what that does. Let's just clear the screen. Okay, activate, right? I'm going to run activate now. So if I just type activate, oh, if I type source activate, what you'll find, let me just clear the screen, is that now you are inside you have activated your virtual environment, okay? And now if I do Python dash dash version, can you guess what the Python version is going to be? It's going to be Python 3.9 because now I'm inside my created virtual environment, right? So I'm now in Python 3.9, okay? And if I install anything else inside of this virtualized folder, like say I install, now if I install any Python library, if I do pip install requests, if I do pip install beautiful soup, all of these pip installs will be installed in my isolated folder, in my virtualized folder, which is Google Projects Env, okay? Which is this place over here. It's going to be installed here and all, and all of these files will be isolated from the system files. And if you want to deactivate your virtual environment, just type deactivate. And now we're outside of our virtual environment. And now if you do any pip installs, it's going to be installed with to your system. Okay, but realistically though, while doing your testing, you are probably going to be in um, you are probably going to be inside of your projects file, right? So let's cd into um, projects and cd into our Google projects. You are probably going to be working inside of Google projects. It's probably from here that you're going to be activating your virtual environment. So how are you going to do that? You do source and then you specify the isolated folder location from the home directory. 
so that's going to be tilde slash um, my ends and I'm just tabbing I'm just typing my and then tab to you know autocomplete and then I type uh, I think it's Google projects I just type goo and then press tab and it auto completes again and then I type bin slash activate because activate was located inside of the bin folder if you recall so if I hit enter I've now got the virtual environment so if I had uh, placed my Google project env inside of Google projects I wouldn't need to write source and then this huge long command the problem of having these folders inside of your uh, project folder is that you might end up committing your virtual environment if you place the virtual environment inside of Google projects and that's something you want to avoid you also probably want to create a git ignore file and that just adds more files to manage and you don't want that I, I personally don't want that and now you can pip install whatever dependency you have for the code that you create so if I need the requests library I just do pip install requests and that finishes the requests installation inside of my virtual environment you still see that I'm inside of my virtual environment and if I do pip pip freeze it will list out all my Python libraries that I have installed inside of my virtual environment which is requests right you have the requests library which I just installed okay and if I deactivate it if I deactivate my Google project env right so hit enter and now if I do pip freeze you have this huge list of Python dependencies and this is the system Python libraries that are installed right you I've got so many stuff over here I've got flask installed I've got IPython installed I've got a lot of Python libraries so this is the system Python libraries that are installed in my computer also note that this the system one works on Python 2 by default and this one works on Python 3 so one last thing I want to mention about so what you see is that it's very clear to you what the what each component you're adding to your environment is and you know what makes your program to run to actually work right and if I want using pip freeze which creates a list of all the dependencies that I have I can actually write all of that dependencies into a text file and then when I give my code over to my developer colleague right I can also um, share the text file with the dependencies in them so that my colleague can recreate this virtual environment and why would I want to recreate this virtual environment because I want the code to not only work on my computer but I want to ensure that it works on somebody else's computer as well so this is why virtual environments are so critical for making sure that your program works right if you think about it testing even this virtual environments it's all for ensuring that our program works not only in our computer but it works on uh, the production side on on any computer on the internet so yeah that's all about virtual environments so we created our folder structure and now we also created our um, virtual environment folder as well so we're done with folder management now okay so now how do I recreate this isolated folder environment on a different computer if I hand off my code to my developer colleague how am I going to recreate the environment for this code to run so the way that you would do this is you simply type pip 
freeze right which uh, the output of which would be this list over here of our dependencies in my virtualized folder and that output I want to pipe that into a different file called the requirements.txt file dot txt right so what happens is the output of this command right which is this list of dependencies gets written to the requirements.txt file awesome so if I hit enter it'll create a requirements.txt file in the current folder that I'm currently in so um, right now I am in right I'm in my Google projects folder so now let's type so if I press enter it's executed now if I list out whatever inside my uh, Google projects folder what you get is the code the test the code and now you get the requirements.txt file as well and if I want to uh, view what's on that you now get a text file uh, which contains um, the list of uh, dependencies okay and now what I can do is let me just clear the screen so now I can use this to recreate my environment on a different computer so I'm going to exit my virtual environment right I'm going to exit my Google projects uh, virtual environment by hitting deactivate now imagine I'm on a completely different computer and I'm going to create a virtual environment but I'm going to create it from the requirements.txt file so the first thing I want to do is python 3.9 um, dash m vn and then I'm going to I'm going to create the virtual environment folder first right in my completely new computer and I'm going to call it uh, and it's going to be in my ends and I'm going to call this folder Re recreated env okay if I hit enter it's going to create a new virtual environment called recreated env I'm going to cd into or you know I'm going to activate recreated env so how do I do that you go you hit source my ends recreated ends you just have to type re and then hit the tab key to um, autocomplete bin slash activate and then hit enter and now I'm inside my recreated environment and here I'm going to now install the dependencies from the requirements.txt file how am I gonna do that I'm gonna do pip install dash r and I'm going to install it from my requirements.txt file and my requirements.txt file was inside I believe um, from the home directory um, this is how I remember it from the home directory it was inside um, projects and then um, requirements right so req tab right so PRO tab slash Google tab slash REQ requirements right so REQ tab and it auto completes so now it's going to pip install all the dependencies mentioned inside of requirements.txt and it's installing all the files mentioned inside of requirements.txt okay so now let's start practicing in order to uh, do our practice uh, we need pytest right so let's open up our virtual environment let's activate our virtual environment right so that's this command here I'm going to activate it and that activates Google project environment okay so now if I want to see the dependencies I can use pip freeze or pip list pip freeze to see the dependencies and 
these are the dependencies over here. Let me just increase the size, All right? So these are my dependencies. You can see that I installed the requests library, which I don't need at this moment in time. So let's remove it. So pip uninst uninstall requests. That's going to remove the requests library from my Google project env, from my virtual environment. Let's clear the screen, it's done. And now let's install the dependencies that we need. Now, we're going to install the one and only thing that we need at, as of this moment, and that's PyTest. So pip install PyTest. And that will install PyTest inside our virtual environment. And it's done. Okay, the second thing that I want to do before I start explaining how to use PyTest is I made a mistake at the home directory. Now I just want to correct one mistake that I made in the naming of my folders. Okay, so if I, the folders that we created were projects and my ends, and this is the place where we're doing our work, the projects folder. If I double click on that, you can see that I named my projects as Google Dash Project and Amazon Dash Project. This is a mistake. You want to rename this. You want to rename your projects um, without the dashes. It needs to be underscore. Okay, it can't be dash. Otherwise, Python is going to give us a lot of problems. If you're wondering what those problems are, don't worry, I'll cover those problems very soon while we're doing our work. So remember, you always want to name your folders and your files, all your folders and all your files with the underscore. Okay, if you're, if there's a space between two words, if, there, if you're naming it as two words, for example, um, this folder is called Google Projects, that's two words. I can separate the words with the underscore key instead of the dash. Hi guys, welcome. Let's get started with testing our code. For this, we need to first write our code. So to do that, hit the Windows key, type VS and it'll autocomplete Visual Studio Code. Hit the Enter key and that opens up our IDE where we will be writing our code. Okay. So we're going to now open up our folder structure that we made. To do that, you use the Control K, Control O shortcut, right, for opening a folder. So Control K, Control O. So now you uh, direct your folder structure. So it's in my home directory, in my projects folder, Google underscore projects. Click OK, and that will open up our folder structure that we made. Right, you see our folder structure right here, and if I and if I drop it down, you can see the entire structure. You have the code folder, the test folder, and the requirements.txt file. Okay, so the first shortcut that you learned was opening a folder. Control K, Control O. The second shortcut that you want to know, and you want to learn all the shortcuts of your um, IDE because that's where you're going to be doing your work. Okay, so. Um, if you so the next most important shortcut is control shift P and with this you can type anything that you want in my case I want this thing in full screen so let's just type full right and it auto completes right and you see that if I just press the enter key it'll, this it'll toggle into full screen and it also tells you what the shortcut key is which is F11 so let me just hit the enter key and there you have it. Let's create our code. To create our code, right click on the code folder and then create a new file. I'm going to call this um, program. I'm going to create my code, right? What is my code going to do? And what is my code going to do? It's going to add two numbers. Okay, so add.py, right? And it's a Python file, so it ends with .py. 
And so it creates an add.py inside the code folder and I'm now able to edit inside of it. Now I'm going to write a program that adds two numbers. Now I'm keeping it simple because the priority is learning the features of PyTest, not coding. Okay, it's about learning the features of PyTest, so I'm going to keep this thing simple. Um, don't worry, I will gradually increase the usefulness of the programs that we create. Okay, but for now, we're just adding two numbers. So we're creating a function, right, using the def keyword, and the name of this function is add underscore function. And it takes two inputs, A and B, and then colon to end the function definition. And now I can start um, defining what this program does. And what does it do? It returns, sorry, it returns an output, which is the sum of the inputs, which is A and B. And that's it. So I made a function using the def keyword. The name of the function is the add function, the add underscore function. And it takes in two inputs. And what it does is, what does this thing do? It, it returns A plus B. Okay, so every time I say add function of, you know, one, one comma two, it's going to do this. Okay, right. So that's our code. It's done. Let's save it. Never forget to save. Control S to save our code. So now let's jump into the testing. So now let's create the test which tests this uh, code. To create a test file, you want to right click on the test folder, just like you did on the code, and you select new file, right? So it'll create a test file inside the test directory. And I'm going to call this test underscore add.py because I'm testing the add file, right? I'm, I'm going to create a test which tests the add.py. Since I'm creating a test for a different function over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make both the files visible. To do that, let's select add.py, hit control shift P, split editor to the right. Okay, so it's going to come up somewhere over here for you because I've already used it before. It's come as the priority. It's come as the first one, split editor to the right. And so what that does, oh wait, that, that's a mistake. I need to select the add.py and then control shift P, split editor to the right. And now I can view my add.py on the right side, which is my code. And let me just close this. And now I can view my test file on the left side. Awesome. So how do you create tests for code? There are three possible test cases that you can create. The first test is for testing whether even this thing works. Okay, so that's the first thing you want to do. The second thing you want to do is you want to test the logic of the code. If it's giving us wrong outputs, then the, then the program is wrong. Okay? and we need to correct it. We need to test the logic. And the third thing is you want to test it against other, you know, as many kinds of inputs as possible. Maybe you want to test it against some kind of exploit, right? You could pass in commands into, into the function and it might actually execute some program commands that it's not made designed for, right? Like an exploit or a hack or something. So you want to test it against um, those kinds of inputs as well. So there are all kinds of tests that you can write. Now I'm just going to create a test for this function which checks the logic. So to do that, let's create a function that tests the add function. Okay, we're testing the add function logic and we want the output to be success. 
me see if I can. Awesome. We're checking the logic of the add function, and we want the test to be a success. So this is how you name your test functions. Okay, your test functions need to be named in a descriptive way. What are you testing? I'm testing the add function, right? I'm testing the logic of the add function. And I'm also, and I want the output of this test to be a success. You can write tests for failures, so um, you want to be descriptive of that. And now let's write the logic of the test. So how do you test the logic of the add function? Obviously, you just pass inputs into the add function and see if the output is correct. So my inputs are going to be a, um, a equals zero, sorry, a equals zero. B equals minus one, okay? And my expected output, if I pass it into the add function, my expected output, if I pass it to the add function, needs to be minus one, right? Right, so let's pass A and B to the add function. to the add function and we're going to store the output of this into the variable called output. Okay, now we're going to do the final check of our test. The way that you do the check is you use the assert keyword which is provided by PyTest. You use assert expected output equal to we're checking whether the expected output and the output we're checking that the expected output and the output are the same a equals 0 b equals minus 1 we expect that if we are adding these two numbers we should be getting minus 1 if the output if the output is not minus 1 then the logic of this function is wrong okay and we need to correct it for example let's say that I was uh, editing this file it's a huge file and somehow somehow I did this right then the output is going to be zero right and my expected output is supposed to be minus one and the test will fail okay so we're done with our test and now let's execute our test a control S to save our test and now we can test okay so when you do control S it's going to give us a problem and the reason why that is is because add underscore function is defined in a different file right so what we want to do so what we want to do is import that into our test file so let's do that to import a function from outside from a different file into your current file there are three steps the first step is very simple you just simply need to uh, do the import statement so it's going to be uh, from code right as in the folder inside your working directory so from code from the code folder take the add file right and from inside that file, I want you to import the add function, add underscore function. So this is the first step you wanna do. So do control S, that'll save. And now what you wanna do is step two, you want to add your working directory to your Python path. And what does this mean? What does that mean? It needs to look in this folder right it needs to look in the google underscore projects folder but this is a folder that we just made right and python doesn't look in other folders it looks only where it is installed where is our python installed it's installed in the home directory in our virtual environment folder okay that's a separate folder so what you want to do is tell python to look inside Google projects so I'm going to open a terminal inside the IDE which is super cool right using the shortcut control 
tilde. The tilde key is above the tab key, the left tab key on my keyboard. Okay, it's actually the single quote. Um, so I'm just saying tilde because I, I'm actually kind of confused. Is this apostrophe or is this single quote? I, I don't know. Okay, so it's the key above the left tab key. And that opens up the terminal. Let's add this working directory, Google Projects, to the Python path. To do that, type export Python path, all in caps, equal to double quotes, dollar sign, open curly brackets. And you want to get the order of these symbols correct. Double quotes, dollar sign, open curly brackets and then type Python path again. Close the curly brackets, colon, and then you add the entire path. You can't be lazy here. You can't type tilde for your home directory. You gotta type the entire home directory. My home directory is slash home. You wanna add the slash before that. Slash, the name of my profile, my Linux profile, it is lab. So this is my home directory, slash home slash lab. In your computer, it might be slash user slash um, whatever your profile name is. If you don't know what your home, home directory is, just open up the terminal, hit the Windows key, um, hit the terminal, um, that, that's our terminal. If you wanna know what your home directory is, um, just hit the tilde key, hit enter, and it'll tell you what your home directory is. It is slash home slash lab for me, okay? So slash home slash lab, and then the location of the working directory, which is Google projects, my root working directory. It's going to be projects, right? Slash Google underscore projects. And then do the double, close the double quotes. So this will add the Google projects folder into the Python path, where Python will look for files to import. And what do we want to import? We want to import, we want to import the add function into other files, like my test underscore add.py, okay? And if you had named Google underscore projects as Google dash projects, this would not work, okay? This export line would not work. Okay, so we have done step two, which is add the Google projects working directory into the Python path. And finally, step three is you have to add an init.py file inside the subfolder containing the program you want to import. Okay, so I'll go slowly here. In the subdirectory, which is containing your program that you want to um, export, right? So here we want to export add function. That is our add.py file. It's located inside the code folder. So inside my code folder, I want to add a new file, which is the double underscore init, double underscore dot py. Hit the enter key and that'll create an init.py file. This file is an empty file, so you can just leave it as that and close it off. Right, so recapping, in order for you to import the add function from the add.py file into other files. You gotta add this line over here, which is standard. The next two steps, so that's step one. Step two is this line of code in the terminal. You gotta execute that. And step three is you gotta add init.py in the folder containing add.py, right? The file which you are exporting to other files. Right, so that's it, that, that's it, we are done. Let's just save both the files, Control S, and over here, Control S again. And we're done. It'll give you errors, it'll, show, it'll give you your file in red saying that there's an error. But the error is not here anymore, right? Before it was here, now it's not here. That underline is gone. Now the error is here, okay? and you can ignore that error. If that is the only error you have left, then you're fine, you're good to go. 
So let's now run our test. Let's clear the terminal. And now to run our test, type pytest. Oh, I made a mistake. You never want to forget activating your virtual environment. You do that using source. My ends. Right slash bin slash activate. So let's clear the um, terminal and now let's run our test and now type pytest. And it says that it passed. Okay. And how do you know it passed? It shows this dot over here, which signifies that it did pass. Um, my preferred way of running pytest is let me just clear the screen. You want to run pytest with the verbose flag dash v. Okay, dash v stands for verbose. So pytest dash v, hit the enter key, and it tells me more about the test. It tells me that I ran a test at test underscore add dot py right from the test folder and the specific function that it tested was this one over here the add function logic and I'm trying to see if it is success and it did pass so you gleam a lot of information about the test okay so in the next lecture I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the output that we've gotten over here if you noticed, all we had to do in the terminal was type pytest and somehow pytest was able to go into our folder and find our test file, right? It was able to know that our test file was located inside of the test folder and inside the test folder we had test underscore add dot py. It knew that that file is our test file and inside that it executed all the test functions inside that test file. So how did PyTest know that these functions are my test functions? How did it know that test underscore add dot py is my test file? How did it know that? And the answer is in the naming. Because I named my test file as test underscore followed by whatever then PyTest is able to recognize it as uh, being a test file. Okay, that's just the way it's built. And then within that, it'll look for test functions. And the way it finds test functions is uh, within the test file, the test function is named as test underscore followed by whatever. And then finally, um, PyTest can also find test classes. It's able to recognize test classes. If you name your class uh, beginning as test followed by whatever keep in mind there is no test underscore here there is no underscore involved in this test class okay also the first letter the T in the test is a capital T okay if you want to change the rules of how tests are named, you can do that by creating a file called pytest.ini. So in our base folder, we create our pytest.ini and in pytest.ini, in the very first line, you type pytest enclosed in square brackets. And then below that, we are going to specify how our test files are going to be named. So to do that, type python underscore files, okay, equal to, and here we specify how the files are going to be named, our test files are going to be named. So here, I'm going to keep the test files as being named test underscore star. Star means whatever, following test underscore. Next is the naming of the functions. So python underscore functions is equal to test underscore star. So I want to keep it the same again. Next, I'm going to specify how the classes, the test classes are recognized by pytest. 
If I want to change how PyTest recognizes um, PyTest files, I can do that. I can change the test underscore star to check underscore star or anything, you know. So now any file name, any Python file that starts with check underscore, PyTest will recognize as a test file. Okay, so I'm going to change it back to test underscore. So Python underscore classes, okay. So I hope you noticed that every one of these variable names is in plural form, right? Files with the S afterwards, right? Files, F-I-L-E-S. Functions, F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N-S, okay? And then classes, C-L-A-S-S-E-S. So the plural form of um, all these objects. So keep that in mind. And the way that I want Python to recognize classes is as anything followed by underscore test class. So that's how I want my test classes to be named. There's a lot of other things that you can do with pytest.ini, but we're going to quickly move on to the other features that pytest gives us. Okay, make sure that you save this file, control S to save. Never forget to save your file. Hi everyone. In the previous lectures, I showed you how to write your first test, a very basic test, and then how to execute that test. From here onwards, I'm going to be demonstrating all the tools that PyTest gives us to help us in our testing journey. Now fixtures solve a problem that us testers face when we're dealing with functions that take time. Okay, so let's say that you have a function. It's loading data, for example. It could be loading data from a database and the database is gigabytes of data. So we want to take one specific data from that database and so to query that database would take, you know, 10 to 15 seconds, maybe a minute. Okay, like if they're really big databases. Or maybe you're querying uh, data from an external website, okay, through an API. This also would take 10 to 15 or maybe more seconds. What we're going to do is first create like a function that seems like it's doing this kind of work that it's taking time for doing work and it returns a value. Okay, so let's first create that and then I'll show you what problems it creates for us. I'm using the existing folder structure. I'm using Google underscore projects itself. I deleted the code from the code folder and I deleted the test from the test folder as well. We will be creating a file called load underscore data because that's what we're going to be doing. We are creating a function that loads data. It could be from our web page or it could be from an external website. We don't care, right? Some some function that takes time to do work. And in this file, we'll create a function def load underscore data underscore function. So a function that loads data, okay? And we're gonna make it look like it's doing something even though it's really not, okay? So we're gonna do this using the time library. So time dot, and we're gonna use the sleep module from inside the time library, which is essentially a delay, okay? Like it's showing that some work is happening and that work is happening for five seconds. Okay, so it looks like this function is doing some work, but we need this function to give us a result. So we're going to do return, and then we're going to return some value. Over here, I'm going to return three, okay? An integer, it returns some integer. And then I'm going to import the time library into this program. So you do import time. Time is an inbuilt library, so we don't need to pip install it. And that's our code. 
So now let's write the test for this fake data loader that we made. The first test is going to be a test where the we're checking whether the load data so test load data is three right we're checking whether the data that we obtained from loading is three and that it is a success okay so in order to check that the load data function is three we have to first you know load the data function so load data function and we store the result into a variable called data. So we, the, the, the data that we obtained, we store into data, into the data variable. And then we assert that the data equals three. Now this test should pass. Okay, so let's move on to our second uh, test function that we're gonna create. And this is a test to check that the data type of the data that we obtained is an integer type. Okay, so def test that the load data is integer, okay, underscore success. So we want it to be successful. We want this test to be successful. And again, to do this, we need to load the data function we need to you know load the data so load underscore so load data function so call that function so call the load data function pass it pass the data that we obtained into a data variable and now we check how do we check these things you use the assert keyword to check that the type of the data that we obtained from the function is equal to int also note that you want to import the load data function from the load data file right from the code file we want to load the code file into the test file so you do that by um, importing it from the code folder which contains the load data file which contains our load data function. So import load data function. So because we rewrote everything in the Google projects folder, we want to re-add the Google projects, the Google underscore projects folder to our Python path. And then we can run our test. So pytest dash V to run our test. And you can see that the first one passed and you can see that the second one also passed. Okay, so now I want you to pay attention to the time that this test took, right over here. You can see that the time that it took to execute this test was 10 seconds, 10.04 seconds. Why did it take 10 seconds for the test to complete? Well, that's because the code, right? Our fake data loader function is taking five seconds okay to do some work and we're using that function in two separate test functions so that means it's taking totally 10 seconds to load the same data okay to access the same data to initialize the data and then access it so we are repeatedly accessing the same data repeatedly Okay, and that function, because it takes time, will take a total of 5 plus 5, 10 seconds. So imagine that we had like 10 to 20 tests that involves us having to load data from a database. That would take what? 10 times, that's 100 seconds, right? So I'll show you how to initialize load data function as a fixture. So first, you want to type at fixture then within parentheses scope equals session and i'll explain what that is later and then type def setup so you're creating a setup function with the fixture label 
and then within the setup function you're passing the object right you're passing this line over here the load data function why because we're using it repeatedly across multiple tests so you want to initialize it once instead of repeatedly initializing it and we're going to initialize it once in our setup function so delete those two lines and paste it into the setup function so you can see that our code reduced right it reduced by one extra line so if this was so if we were using this function in five or six you know or ten different tests then we would be reducing it by nine lines right okay so after this we run return data okay so the result of this setup function is that uh, the data the load data function runs and it returns the output of that function right which is our uh, data which we obtain from our database our fake database okay and so what you want to do is uh, pass the setup function into the other test functions and now you want to replace the data variable with the setup variable because you're passing setup into the other functions so assert setup equal to equal to three is essentially the same as assert data equal to equal to three because what you're returning from setup is data itself so assert setup equal to three is assert data equal to three because the result of setup is return data setup turns into the data variable itself okay and you do that for the second test function as well you replace data with setup so type of setup equal to equal to integer is the same as saying type of data equal to equal to integer and now uh, we'll run our code oh but before that you can see that there's a that the at fixture has a red underline and that's because we need to import fixture so don't get to import fixture so from pytest import fixture okay and now i think we're done we can now run our test and hopefully so this time what's different is that the load data function initializes only once okay so we are loading the data only once and this will reduce the time of the test pytest dash v and you can see that our test has run in five seconds this time so it ran only once okay so that's how fixtures help us it reduces the number of lines of code and it can reduce the uh, testing time welcome to this lecture you and me are gonna do a very small real world project to keep things interesting we're gonna write a, a single test for a website called aol.com aol used to be called netscape it used to be one of the biggest search engines before uh, Google was a thing. So if we were playing pretend, we could pretend that AOL approached us and asked us to test the their website, okay? But they weren't giving us access to the code. Okay, they just asked us, this is our website, it's online, it's on the internet, we want you to access it through the internet and test our website. Now, obviously, we're just going to write the very first test that you would write for testing a website. And that test would be to uh, check whether this website is online. So what we're going to do is we're going to control a browser through our Python program. I'm going to show you how to do that. Once you learn how to control the browser, you know, how to open a browser through Python, then 
uh, all we need to do is go to the website, right? Go to the URL. After that, all we need to do is check for the title bar at the top of the screen. So if their web page is down, then it's going to give you an error in the title bar. Okay, it's going to give you an error web page, but it's also going to give you an error in the title bar. But if it's working, it's going to have the name of the website on the title somewhere. Okay. For this tutorial, I'm also going to show you how to use fixtures in a way that you probably never thought was possible. You're probably wondering how do fixtures apply over here? Uh, and I'm going to show you and you're going to realize that there are ways to use fixtures uh, in ways that you never thought was possible. Since we're controlling Chrome using our Selenium library right through our Python program, you want Chrome to be configured for that. So Chrome is not going to allow, you know, just a Python program to control it. So you need to specifically configure Chrome for that. Okay. Now, uh, so we need to configure Chrome and if you don't have Chrome, you also need to download it. So over here, I've opened up my browser and in the address bar, I type install Chrome because my address bar automatically searches Google. Okay. So if I hit enter, it's going to search the keyword in google.com and this first link should be enough. So I'm going to click on that. You want to be careful of these add links. So maybe it's not a good idea to select this very first link. Uh, you can go down and maybe you can find the um, the page for downloading Chrome and then click on this blue button over here and you want to download the .deb file so we're going to download .deb say OK and we're going to save this file so I'm going to select save OK and you can see on the top right the progress of our download and it's almost done. I'm just going to click on that icon and you can see I already downloaded another copy of this, but let's uh, just open this one over here. I'm going to open the folder in which it's located in and you can see there are two files. The code file on the left was the uh, VS code code that's selected over here is the Google Chrome uh, .deb file, which we've just downloaded. So what you want to do now is right click in this area and then open in terminal. Okay. And what that does is it opens the terminal, but from uh, the folder that our Google Chrome dot deb file is located in our downloads folder. Okay. So it's automatically going to open up in the downloads folder. And what you want to do is you want to run this following line over here. You want to type sudo dpkg dash i and then type G -O -O Google and then hit tab to autocomplete. The .deb file starts with Google and it's the only file which contains that starting letters. So if you hit tab, it will autocomplete. Okay, and it asks you for your password. Okay, we're done. So we've got Google Chrome installed. Okay, so that was installing Google Chrome. If you didn't have it, what you want to do now is configure Google Chrome to be able to be controlled by our Python program, right? Through Selenium. So what you want to do is open the browser and type download Chrome driver. Okay, this is what's going to help us control the browser through our Python code. And you want to click on the very first link over here, chromedriver.chromium.org. And you want to download the Chrome driver for the specific Chrome version that you have installed. So since I've downloaded the latest Chrome just now, it's probably going to be the very first link. Okay. Now you can find out which version which Chrome driver version you want to install by opening the terminal, hit the windows key, control alt T that's the shortcut for opening the terminal. 
and you can type Google dash Chrome space dash dash version, right? And you can find out what version your Chrome browser is. And this one is 90. And so that means that I need to install the second link. I'm surprised it's not the first one. And I'm using a Linux operating system and it's a 64 bit uh, Linux operating system. And you got to know which uh, bit version yours is. Is it 32 bit or 64 bit? You got to figure that out. So that's what I want to download. I click on that link. And on the top right, you can see it's already done. And I'm just going to click on that icon and click on this folder button to open the containing folder. And here we have the file that we downloaded, which is Chrome driver. Okay. So now what? Now what you want to do is copy this file. Okay. So CP tilde slash down underscore Linux 64 slash Chrome driver space. Okay. So you're copying this file to the slash user slash local slash bin folder location. Okay. So this is the location where you have all your binary files and Chrome driver. The file will only function if we put it into this uh, folder location. Okay. So we're going to start from scratch from the very beginning. I'm going to create the folders using the terminal. So let's open the terminal, hit the windows key and then type term to get the terminal and then press the enter key to open the terminal. So I open the terminal this way to uh, keep my hands on the keyboard. Okay. So, so right now we open the terminal and right now we are at the home directory, which for me is slash home slash lab. Okay. So lab is my profile name. So you can find out what your home directory is by typing PWD, as I said before. So let's change our directory to the projects folder. Let's CD into projects. And then in our projects folder, um, we're going to create and now we're going to create a completely new projects folder called AOL projects. So make directory MKDIR AOL underscore projects, right? Because we have a new project um, which is given to us by AOL. Now we can go into uh, this folder by CD AOL underscore projects. Okay, so I've decided to do the work inside of AOL underscore projects. Obviously AOL can give us even more projects so we can create like multiple subfolders within AOL uh, projects folder. Um, but I've decided not to do that because that's just too many subfolders for me. Uh, AOL has approached me to test their website, but they have not given me access to the code. Okay. So there is no code folder. So I'm just going to be creating the test. So let's create the test folder. So MKDIR uh, test. And that is our folder structure. Okay. So for this completely new project, we are also going to create a virtual environment folder where we are going to store all the dependencies for um, this project. So to do that, it's Python three dash M V N tilde slash my ends slash, you know, I created uh, all my virtual environments in the my ends folder. So now I'm going to create a new virtual environment called AOL underscore env. Okay. So if you remember, before I created all my virtual environments inside of my ends. And now I'm going to create AOL 
um, underscore n. Okay, now we need to install the dependencies inside the virtual environment, right? What do we need for doing our work? So it looks like in this video here, I've opened up VS Code and this is the work that we did before. I'm gonna select file and then open the folder which I created. All right, we created our new folder um, inside of projects called AOL underscore projects, right? So that's the folder structure that we created and um, that's our folder structure, okay? And I'm gonna create the test file underneath the test in the test folder, right? I'm gonna create my test file now. Um, keep in mind that I haven't created, I haven't installed the dependencies yet. So the test file is gonna be called test underscore website.py, right? Because I'm testing the AOL website, right? So it's test underscore the website. Okay, so before I forget, let's just install the dependencies. Uh, let's open the terminal, control tilde. That opens the terminal. Um, we need to activate our virtual environment to install the dependencies inside of the virtual environment. So that's source and then our virtual environment directory is tilde slash my ends where I store all my virtual environments and this virtual environment is called AOL underscore env slash bin slash activate and hit the enter key and I'm going to clear the screen and now we can install our dependencies inside of the virtual environment. The first thing that you need is Selenium. So we're going to pip install Selenium. And what Selenium does for us is it'll help us control a browser through our Python code. So it's a library which contains programs which help us control a browser, a Chrome browser or a Firefox browser. The next dependency that you want to install is PyTest. So pip install PyTest. Pip space install space PyTest. Uh, I would recommend you pip install PyTest at this point. It looks like in the video I forgot to install PyTest and it looks like I'm moving on. Um, in the video I'm probably going to run the code and it's not gonna work and I'm probably gonna realize that okay I've not installed PyTest. Okay, so in the video, I'm moving on and I am now writing the test. The first thing that you want to do is import Selenium because we're going to control a browser through our Python code. Okay, we're going to do that using Selenium. So what we want to do is import Selenium. So from Selenium, from Selenium, import web driver enter this next block of code well i'll just show you this next block of code and then explain to you what's happening over here so i'm going to create a fixture so you can see that i created a fixture okay and you create a fixture by um, first you know uh, mentioning the fixture label the app fixture label and with the setup function and you create a setup function underneath that. And then you initiate whatever objects that you're going to use, whatever stuff that you're going to use um, across multiple tests. And over here, we are going to be using the browser, right? We're going to open up a browser for every test, right? So all our tests, we're going to be opening a website in a browser okay for every single test that's what we're gonna do so this browser needs to be a fixture okay the way that you call the browser is using the web driver dot chrome method all right so you can call the chrome browser from the web driver which we imported from Selenium. 
okay and now i can pass that into the browser variable now you're probably wondering why the syntax is in this way and that's because um, that's just how the author designed it okay if you go on to google and you go into the documentation documentation is probably a bit more complex if you check out um, if you just search on google how to use selenium this is how it's going to show up okay so it's just the way that the authors designed it okay so we will be controlling the browser using the browser variable over here and then you return the browser okay so every time you call the setup function you're in fact getting the browser variable okay and now we can pass the browser into our different tests okay so i'll show you how that is done now okay so what what do we do now we're going to now test the website right as soon as python reaches the fifth line over here then we have a browser that is created okay we have a browser object created okay so now we can go to a web page so we're going to get the aol.com page using the get request and then we're going to test whether this page is in fact online that is def we're going to define a function which is def test web page title we're going to test that the web page title is success so we're going to test that this web page has some sort of a title on it and for this test function we're going to pass in the setup function that we created which is our browser okay so whenever you pass the setup function you're in fact trying to pass the browser into the test function so how do you get you know aol.com well you can run browser.get method and then pass in the the website that you want so it's going to be browser.get and then www.aol.com but because we've initialized our browser as a fixture what you need to do is set up dot get and then pass in the website that we want to get okay so over here the way that you think about this is how does the line number nine make sense whenever you call setup you're in fact calling the browser variable okay the browser variable whenever you call the setup function you're in fact getting the browser uh, variable so it's in fact uh, browser dot get okay so you're in fact calling the browser dot get method okay once we've gotten the web page we want to check that the title bar has aol inside of it so asserting that there is aol in setup dot title okay so you can access the title bar from the browser variable itself so when you do setup dot title it's in fact browser dot title so you're accessing the title bar from the browser variable so you can do that and you know what that's it and now we can run a test okay so open the terminal control tilde you want to make sure that the virtual environment is activated so we have the virtual environment activated and now we're going to run pytest so pytest dash v and if i hit enter uh, the command is not found so i'm going to clear the screen you know it's it's at this point in the video that i realized that i did not install pytest in our virtual environment okay so installing pytest at this point so pip install pytest which i was a bit, you know i realized that i forgot to install it okay as i mentioned before i've done that okay so now we can run pytest dash v okay 
so now we can run pytest dash v what is it doing it's opening the browser and it's going to aol.com and now it's checking that the title of this page is has aol in it and you can see over here that it does have aol in the title so hopefully the assert statement comes true it looks like it's taking a bit of time you can also see that uh, it's telling you that this chrome browser is being controlled by our um, code okay by our python code okay so the test passed so one thing that we could do to improve the code would be to add a wait to kind of wait for the browser to load okay so i'll show you in the in our fixture right after we initialize our browser we can do a wait so browser dot implicitly underscore wait and we're going to wait for five seconds so we're going to wait for the browser to load okay it might take like five seconds for chrome to show up so i'm just going to wait for the browser to show up so browser dot implicitly underscore wait um, for five seconds and that will you know um, give some time for the browser to load i'm also going to add another wait statement over here after we have loaded the aol.com web page right so we want aol uh, web page to so we want to wait so it's going to take some time for the web page to load as well right so it's going to be set up dot implicitly underscore wait right uh, because in the test function, we are passing the setup, right? And in the test function, setup means browser. So it's actually browser dot implicitly wait. And now um, let's just run the code again. Let's run the test again, pytest dash v. It opens the browser, goes to aol.com. And it's checking that the title has AOL on it as you can see over here. Yeah, so, and the browser closes and the test passes. And that took around 37 seconds, okay? Because my computer is very, very slow. I'm gonna clear the screen and that's it, okay. To demonstrate the other features that PyTest gives us, I'd like to add one more test function. You're gonna have to forgive me because I'm gonna break away from our make-believe example that uh, AOL uh, approached us, okay, to test their website. And instead, uh, for my second test function, we're going to test uh, google.com, okay? We're going to test that the google.com is up and if it's successful, um, Google should show up in the title. So a second test function is going to be just like our first one. And here it is. It looks similar to the first one. I've changed the name of our uh, test function. The first one as test web page title AOL underscore success. Okay. So I've added the AOL part. For the second function, uh, we're doing the same thing except for google.com and I've added Google uh, into the um, test function name. And we're checking that we have the Google string in the uh, title of the, of the browser. Okay, in this video, we're gonna be talking about a completely new feature and that is writing teardowns, okay? So teardown code is code that you want to execute after the scope of the fixture uh, is exited. So let's say that the scope of the fixture right now is uh, function. So the teardown code is code that will execute after every test function is uh, exited. So after our first test function, it'll exit and then go and uh, execute some extra code for us after it exits the test function. 
So the teardown code will execute after it exits the first test function and it'll execute the teardown code and then it'll move on to the, the next, the second test function, which is testing google.com's web page. So the way that you define your teardown code is uh, the following. Instead of return browser, you hit yield browser, right? And then below yield browser, you type your teardown code. So over here, our teardown code is going to be browser.close, right? For closing our browser. And that's again, probably not too relevant because the browser closes automatically. So maybe instead of closing the browser, um, you could delete the cookies after every test. So what happens is you will yield the browser. So uh, the browser is returned to the test function. And then uh, we go into the body of the test function. And once the test function is executed, we then go back to our fixture and we continue the execution of the teardown code. The reason why we changed return to yield is because when you return something from a function, that's usually the end of the function. But when you type yield, it tells the computer to come back to the fixture after the scope uh, exits. Okay. So the scope here is function. So for every test function, I want you to come back to the fixture and execute everything below the yield keyword. Okay. So the order of execution is, so you have your uh, fixture initialized after the test function is completed, the fixture is destroyed and then we exit the test function and then go into the teardown code. And then after the teardown code, only do we go back to the uh, next test function and initialize a completely new fixture. So completely new browser for the second test function. And after the second test function is complete, the browser is destroyed and then again execute the teardown code, which is uh, deleting the cookies and then closing the browser. So what is the kind of stuff that you want to add in your teardown code? So if you've initialized a browser as your fixture, maybe you might want to clear the cookies after the test function is complete. Okay. Because cookies could uh, interfere with the next test. If however, you've initialized a database in your fixture, then maybe then you might want to close a database right after each test function is exited. Okay. And this is considering that the scope is set to function. If the scope is set to session, then the teardown executes only after at the very end of the test session. And then uh, we execute our teardown code. So teardown executes at the very end of the scope. And the nature of the teardown code is probably going to be, you know, closing off any loose ends like closing off a database, closing out the browser, or maybe you want to display some messages at the end of the uh, scope of your fixture. So that's what teardown is all about. Yeah. And that's that. Let's move on.
Okay, now it's time to talk about parameterization. It's another feature that PyTest gives us to help us in our testing. So as you saw in our code, we have two test functions, right? We're testing AOL page to see if it's up. And then we're also testing the Google page to see if it's up by looking at the titles. Now in these two test functions, we're essentially doing the same thing. The only difference is the web page that we're visiting and the title that we're checking for. So keeping this in mind, I'm going to show you how to combine these two test functions into a single test function. Okay. You can write both of these test functions as a single test function. So we're going to replace the website, which is AOL.com with a variable. And then we're going to pass uh, multiple inputs into this variable. So the variable is going to be website and I'm going to pass, I'm going to iterate the value of this variable so that we can visit multiple websites. And the second thing that we're going to change is the title, right? So the title, I'm going to replace the string with a variable so I can pass multiple strings. I can iterate different uh, strings that I want to check as the title. So what you want to do is we're going to get rid of the second test function completely. And now we are just left with our first test function. We're going to pass two websites into the website variable and we're going to pass two titles into the title variable. So we're going to do this by typing at mark dot parameterize. So it's pronounced parameterization, but for some reason they spelt it as parameterize. So parameterize, P-R-I-Z-E. It's not parameterize, T-E. There is no T-E. It's T-R-I-Z-E. It's parameterize. And what you want to pass into this is the two variables that we're going to iterate, and that is website and uh, expected title. So in this specific thing, you want to pay attention. It's a single string, right? So you have the single quote, website, comma, expected underscore title, single quote. So you can see that website and expected title is a single string, okay? Website is not separate string and expected underscore title isn't a separate string either. So I want to pass both the variables as a single string separated by commas. Okay, comma. And now we're going to pass the pair of values, right? So we're going to pass it as square brackets. So it's a list of pairs, square brackets. And then we have our pair, normal brackets, the website, comma, and then the string, which is the title, right? So the website and the title, and then you close the brackets, comma, open brackets, uh, google.com, comma, and then the title of the Google page. So you have the website and then the title as pairs. And then what you want to do is pass these variables into our test function and then use those variables inside of our test functions, right? So we already passed the setup uh, fixture. Now we need to pass in the website variable and the expected title variable. Okay. And you can already see that I've used the website variable and the expected title variable inside the test function. Yeah, and that's it. So um, you, you don't want to forget to import the parameterize label. Parameterize is inside of Mark and Mark is inside of um, a library called PyTest, right? So we need to import the Mark 
uh, decorator. To do that, it's from PyTest import mark. Okay? So just like importing the fixture decorator, you also want to import the uh, parameter the, the mark dot parameterize decorator. So parameterize is something that's inside of mark. So we need to import mark. So from PyTest import mark. Code, open the terminal, uh, control tilde, and now pytest dash v. Make sure you're in you have the virtual environment activated and we have our output. Remember, we are running two tests this time using a single test function. So the first test is checking AOL.com, going to AOL.com and um, checking that the title AOL is in the title bar. And you can see that it is. So it's probably gonna be a success. And now it needs to go to google.com. So you can see, okay, we've gone to google.com and it was able to also find Google in the title bar of that web page as well. So you can see that even though we had only one test function, uh, we've run it twice for two websites, right? AOL.com and Google.com. The pair of AOL.com, which is the website, and AOL, which is the um, string. So it's showing us the inputs that we did for our first test. And then for the second variation of the same test, we passed a different set of inputs. So this is how you can turn, uh, you know, blocks of test functions into a single test function if, you know, all of them are doing the same thing. You can use parameterization and simply uh, pass it as a single function thereby reducing the amount of code. That's the most important thing. This is the reason why we're doing this. We're reducing the amount of code and um, because you don't have to type, you don't have to type all the extra stuff, you, you're actually saving on time. If you have like, let's say 10 uh, test functions, which is doing the same thing, you can just write it as a single test function. So you can save up on time and you can save up on uh, code space as well. The test file can be more small, more compact, and more easy to read. So yeah, that's it. Let's move on. If you want to create variables and then pass multiple inputs into those variables, you can do this parameterization. Okay, that's what parameterization is. You can also parameterize the fixture function, right? So suppose you want to parameterize something inside the setup function. You can do that there as well. But the syntax is a bit different. Okay, so why would you want to parameterize the fixture? So let me give you an example. Suppose we want to use multiple browsers. If you see in line seven, we're just using the Chrome browser, right? Browser is equal to webdriver.chrome. Suppose we want to use multiple browsers, then what? Well, we can use parameterization there as well. You can replace Chrome from line seven with a variable and then pass multiple inputs. You can pass Chrome, you can pass Firefox, you can pass, uh, God forbid, Internet Explorer. Um, when you're doing this for a fixture, the syntax is a bit different. So within the fixture label, we have the scope equals session. And what you want to do is pass one more parameter, and that is params. Okay, params equals and then the different values that you want to pass into the variable okay so we are passing the chrome browser right so webdriver.chrome and we're also passing the firefox browser so that's webdriver.firefox so uh, 
please note that Chrome and Firefox, the C and the F, right? The, the C of the Chrome is a capital letter and the Firefox, the, the, the first F is also a capital letter. So you want to pay attention to those uh, intricacies. Okay. And we are passing this into our setup function, right? We want to replace that with this is, and what you want to pass inside of the setup function as a parameter is a request, which is an inbuilt uh, process provided to us by PyTest. Okay. Okay. So request is a um, data type. It's a, it's a, it's an object that allows us access to any uh, variables that are initialized inside of the fixture uh, label. So right now we have scope equals session. We're not passing scope into the setup function, but we are passing params into the setup function. So we can access that through the request variable. Okay. And I'll show you exactly how that is done. So the variable which we are going to pass our Chrome browser and Firefox is not params. It is the request variable. Okay. Params is just a way for us to tell PyTest, okay, I'm doing parameterization within the fixture as well. Okay. Now, why is it so different? Well, that's just the way the authors decided it was going to be. Um, the place that we, we need to put our request is in line seven. Okay. So I can access the params variable using request, right? Request gives us access to all the variables, uh, initialized in the fixture label. Um, that's just the way the authors made it to be. So, right. We're just going to follow the documentation that the authors gave us. Okay. So, Browser is equal to request dot params. So then uh, now we're going to replace webdriver dot Chrome with our variable. It's going to be request dot param. Okay. P A R A M. And that's just the way the authors made it. Okay. So before we execute, there is a mistake that I've made in line five. Okay. Params. Uh, is an array of values, right? I'm passing an array of, I'm iterating an array of values into our variable, right? So if you look at that line, params is equal to webdriver.chrome, comma, webdriver.firefox. That's the wrong way of uh, declaring an array. We have to put both those values inside of square brackets. And I fix it by put by enclosing both the browsers in the square bracket. So now it becomes a, a array of values that we pass into the variable, right? So we're iterating the test using the Chrome browser and the Firefox browser. So since we're using another browser, we're using Firefox as well. You need to make sure Firefox is installed and you have to configure Firefox to be controlled by Selenium. To control Chrome by Selenium, we had to install the Chrome driver, right? Similarly, for Firefox to be controlled by Selenium, we need to install something called the Gecko driver. If you're using Ubuntu, you probably have Firefox installed. Okay. In my case, I have Firefox installed, but if you're using Kali Linux, the Firefox that you have installed is a special version called Firefox ESR, and it's not going to work with Selenium. So what you want to do if you're using Kali Linux is install a completely fresh Firefox. Okay. We're not going to make it our default browser, right? Because I prefer Firefox ESR. So I'm just going to install it somewhere uh, in the downloads folder or something. Okay, so let's install Firefox, proper Firefox. So open up your browser and in the search bar, I'm just going to search for download 
Firefox. Don't mind the spelling. And I'm going to click on the first link. And I'm going to click on this blue box over here. It says download Firefox and just download the browser. I'm going to save the file. Okay. And I'm going to click OK. On the top right, you can see an arrow icon shows me that the file is downloading. And it's done. I'm just going to open the containing folder. And there we have our Firefox. So it's a compressed file. So this is not a deb file. It's a compressed file. So we need to extract it. I'm going to right click on the file. And then click on extract. And then extract the archive here in this folder. And you can see that we have a Firefox folder here. I'm going to click. I'm going to go inside of it. Scroll down and I'm going to double click on this Firefox file and execute the file. And that will open up the normal Firefox. Okay, not Firefox ESR, normal Firefox. So I can run this from the downloads folder. Okay, this Firefox will allow Selenium to control it. So let's configure this Firefox browser. I'm just going to search for Gecko driver in the search bar. All right, that's the file that allows Selenium to control uh, Firefox. So I'm going to click on the first link. And I need to choose a Gecko driver version, right? Since I've installed the latest version of Firefox, the latest version of Gecko driver should work with it. So I'm using Linux and I'm on a 64 bit computer. So Gecko driver uh, version 0.29.1 Linux 64 dot tar dot GZ. You don't want to go for that dot tar dot GZ dot ASC. You want to go for the simple one. Simple is good. We're going to save. We're going to click on that link and we're going to save and click OK. And it's downloading Gecko driver. So the download uh, was complete. Um, I'm showing you the Gecko driver file inside my downloads folder. And what I need to do with Gecko driver is I want to put it inside of the binaries folder, right? Just like we did with Chrome driver. So I'm going to take this file. I'm going to, I'm just going to right click and open uh, in terminal. So this folder, the downloads folder. So we open the terminal from the downloads folder. Okay. When we do that, I'm going to list all the files inside of the downloads folder. Okay, and there we have our Gecko driver. I'm going to copy cp sudo cp. I'm going to copy the Gecko driver into the binaries folder, which was slash user usr slash local slash bin bin. It stands for binary. Type your password. So now uh, Firefox can be controlled through our Python code. Okay, now we can execute the file. Before we do that, I'm just going to delete these uh, files on the left. Uh, these are files that are generated every time you run a test. So I want things to look clean. And that's why I'm doing that. Okay, so open the terminal. Let's control tilde and this was our previous test. Let's clear the screen and run our test. Pytest dash V uh, control tilde Pytest dash V. You want to make sure your virtual environment is activated. Okay. It is. And the test is running. And now you have Mozilla Firefox also opening up. So you can see that a Chrome opens up first and then you have Firefox opening up and then only does uh, Chrome check out all the websites. So first you have AOL.com. Okay. It checks for the title. It checks if there's an AOL in the title. If it is, that means we got the website and the website is up. And now it goes to Google.com and it moves on. And the Chrome browser closes off. We now have 
Firefox running. And now AOL opens up in Firefox. It checks for the title, goes to google.com, and that's it. Okay, and you can see the output of the tests. You can see that each browser is denoted by a separate setup function, right? Chrome browser was setup zero. Firefox is setup one. Right, so that's how you do parameterization in the fixture. And you use it mainly if you are, uh, if you want to test against different varieties of browsers, different varieties of databases, different uh, brands of the fixture object. You can test it against the MongoDB database. You can test it against the a different type of I don't know, SQL database, right? It's probably not going to work um, if you do it that way. But there you can see that there is like fringe cases over here. Right. So uh, that's it. Let's move on. In this lesson, we're going to cover a very special Python file called conftest.py. So conftest.py is a Python file where we store all our fixtures. So far, as you can see in this file, I wrote the fixture and the test in a single file to help you understand all the concepts, right, uh, that we've done so far. But the reality is, when you work in a company, you're supposed to split the fixture and the test files. Okay, you need to have a separate fixture file and you need to have a separate test file. In reality, your code is going to be much more bigger, which means your fixture is going to be huge. And so, so if you browse your fixture file, you're going to find this huge block of code, which is your fixture block. And it's going to be huge and you want to be able to skip through that and you don't want that, right? You don't want some other type of code that is doing something else to be mixed with your test functions. If you're browsing your test file, you expect test functions inside that file. So you want to keep your fixtures in your fixture file and you want to keep your tests in your test file. Okay, so let me show you um, how that's done. So uh, inside the test folder, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to right click on the test folder and create a new file. And the file I'm going to be creating is conftest.py. C-O-N-F-T-E-S-T dot P-Y. And in conftest.py, we're just going to take the fixture and we're going to paste it into conftest.py. Select the fixture block, control C, go to your conftest.py and control V to paste. In order for the fixture to work, you also want to import the fixture, right? You also want to import it. So from PyTest, import fixture, right? So I'm just going to copy that as well. So we're just going to select control C and then paste into the conftest.py. So now we have imported the fixture. Now we can delete those lines of code that we pasted, right? I'm deleting the first line and I'm also deleting the fixture. So I'm going to select and then backspace delete. Okay, so now let's look at both the files at a glance. I'm going to right click on conftest.py and try and split it to the right side. Okay, so now you can see that I have my test on the right side and I have the fixture on the left side, right? My fixtures, the conftest.py. Okay, so that's my fixture and here is my test. Okay, so it looks like I forgot to paste one more line and that is importing selenium. And we need that in the fixture file because from selenium we're getting a browser, right? and we're initializing that browser in the fixture. So we need Selenium in the fixture file. Okay, so that import statement from Selenium import WebDriver, we need to paste that into 
we need to copy it, select it, copy, control C, and then we need to paste that into our fixture file, right? Our conftest.py. Okay, and that's about it. Okay, so that's our fixture on the left and our test on the right. Right, and that's it. That's all there is to it. Let's try and run PyTest and see if everything works. You always want to save the code that you're running. In this case, we are running both the fixture and the test files. They're both working together. Okay, so you need to save both the files that you've modified. So control S to save conftest.py, our fixture file, and then uh, select the test file and then control S to save the test file as well because we modified both of them. Okay, now we can run the code. So open the terminal, control tilde, pytest-v to run the code, and Chrome browser opens up. It should go to aol.com. Oh, yeah, and Mozilla Firefox opens up. Um, I'm just going to minimize this. So we can see both the browsers. You can see that Chrome has gone to AOL.com and it's now trying to read the title. Next up is Google.com and it's checking for Google in the title. That happened really quick in Mozilla Firefox. We have AOL.com repeats the test for the second browser as well and it's checking for the AOL title and it should be a success. And it should go to google.com next. This And the Google test happens really quick. Right. And at the bottom you can see all the tests have passed. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that our test is running just like before. Right? Despite the fact that we separated the fixture and the test. Now, this is actually weird if you think about it. Because uh, if we go into our code, if we go into our test file, let me remove the terminal, control tilde to remove the terminal, make the test file more visible. Okay, you can see that in our test file, we haven't even imported the fixture, right? We've not imported conftest.py, we haven't imported the fixture, and yet somehow all we had to do was pass the setup function, if you can see in line 8, we have the setup um, variable, right? That's our setup function. We're passing that into our test function. So how can we do that without importing the fixture? Okay, PyTest recognizes that if you create a conftest.py file, it's a fixture file, and it will automatically import the fixture to all the test files. Okay, and it's able to recognize the test files because they start with test underscore. So PyTest is doing a lot of the work in the background. We don't have to import the fixture or conftest.py. We don't have to import conftest.py, nor do we have to mention anything about the fixture. All we have to do is just pass the setup function and it'll have access to um, all the fixture data that we're passing like the browser in this case. So that's uh, separating your fixtures from your test files. Uh, whenever you start a project, you want to first create your fixtures as a conftest.py, and then you want to create the tests in your uh, test files, okay? So that's how you create the code in a real project. In this lesson, I want to talk about another feature that PyTest gives us, and that is the ability to mark our tests. So imagine again that we are testing the AOL.com website. Uh, so what are the kinds of tests that you would write here? The very first test that you want to write is a test to make sure that the website is up. We have already done that, right? And that's a very important test because if the website is up, that means people can visit the website and they can interact with the front page at least, okay? Whatever content is there on the front page, maybe they might end up reading the content on the 
the very first page. What's another test that's very important, right? The search bar, right? You can see that there's a search bar. So maybe people want to use the website to use the search engine. Maybe they want to search something using AOL.com. And if they do that, well, they're going to be interacting with the website longer. The first few search links are probably going to be ad links, right? And people might click on those. And so the website makes money. So you also want to make sure that the search bar is working. So you want to test the search bar. It's very important. Okay, another test that you could write is a subset of the search feature. For example, as you see me type Google into the search bar, you can see that there's an auto completion taking place. So that's another feature, but that feature isn't as important. Nevertheless, it enhances the experience of the user. Still not important. Okay, so what's another test that you could write? On the top right, you can see a very small mail icon. So obviously people would want to use mail right on this website. So customers would probably stick longer on the websites if they use the mail feature. So you probably want to write tests that people can send and receive mails. Okay. Another sub feature within the mail could be like spam, right? Uh, you could write tests to make sure that um, the anti-spam feature also works. But the anti-spam feature isn't a critical feature. Okay, so anti-spam feature is probably not going to be an important test. So why am I talking about important tests and not important tests? When you're shipping out a product, you want to ship out the product as fast as you can. And that means prioritizing, you know, just making the product, which means that you want to write tests for only the critical components. And why do you want to write tests only for the most critical components to get the product out as fast as possible? So I decide, OK, I'm going to write all these tests. OK, so let's switch on over to our text editor. And let me write a few of these tests. So the first test I'm going to write is a test uh, just to test that the web page is up. So test the web page works. OK, and that should be a success. OK, now I'm not going to write the entire test. I'm just going to I'm just going to assert that it is true. OK, so I'm just mocking the test, right? What's important here isn't, you know, all these tests. What's important is the feature I'm about to show you. OK, so another test would be that the search feature works, right? So test search. So def test search works success. OK, and that should be a success. So test that the search works. Okay. Another test would be to test that the auto completion feature of the search bar works. So test underscore autocomplete should be a success. Assert true. So let's write some of these tests out. Test mail login success. Okay. So that, you know, people can use the mail. Um, after you log in, you want to make sure that the spam feature the anti-spam feature. Okay, so that's a mistake from my side. No matter, let's move on. So now let's run the tests. Control tilde and run PyTest. No surprises here, all the tests passed. So now let me demonstrate the feature that I was talking about, which is the mark feature. So PyTest gives us a feature called uh, markers where you can mark your tests using the mark decorator. So let me show you how I'm going to mark the search feature as an important test. So what I can do is I can mark 
the important and not so important tests. Right, using at mark dot, and then I can give it whatever label I want. So here, uh, important. Okay, so mark is an inbuilt PyTest decorator, and we can mark our tests as whatever we want to mark them as. And once I've marked the tests as whatever I want them to, I can run specifically the important tests, and that's what the mark feature allows us to do, right? Customizable running of tests, where you don't have to run all the tests, you just run specific tests that you've marked. And in this case, I'm only running the important tests. Now, before I run the test, I'm just going to talk about documenting the markers that you create. So you also wanna document all the markers that you create because when you have a very big file and you have lots of markers, a complete newbie to this code would want to know what all the markers are for these tests, right? So you can, so you need a place where all the markers are listed. And uh, the place where you list these markers is pytest.ini. If you recall, pytest.ini is a file where we define how we name our test files, how we name our test functions, and how we name our test classes. Okay, so let's create the pytest.ini file. pytest.ini file is a file that is outside of the test folder, okay? So you want to create this inside your project directory, okay, not inside the test folder. So for that, right click outside over here, and then click select new file. Uh, so pytest.ini, okay? And if you recall, pytest.ini looks something like this. So you type pytest within square brackets. We're defining what the test files, functions, and classes need to be typed out. So along with this, we need to compile a list of all the markers that we're using in our test suite. To do that, this type markers is equal to, and then the name of the marker that you just created. I created a marker called important. So that's my marker. And now I can give a description of my marker. Okay, the important tests. Okay, let's switch on over to our test. So now let me show you how to run only the important tests, okay? So switch on over to our test file and open the terminal, control tilde. Make sure you save the file before you run it. Okay, never forget to save, control S, select the file and then control S to save. Uh, control tilde to open the terminal and run the test. It's pytest dash v dash m, which means we are going to run te only uh, tests which are uh, labeled with a marker and the marker is important, okay? So we're going to run tests with the important marker and the marker needs to be enclosed in double quotes, as you can see here. Hit the enter key. So you can see that a test to check that the web page works, a test to check that the search feature works and the test to check that the mail login works are the only tests that we ran, okay? So it ran only the tests which I labeled as important, okay, using the mark decorator. If you want to avoid marking every single test function, what you can do is group your test functions into a class. So let me show you an example. So I'm going to create a class called uh, important underscore test class. So if you recall in pytest.ini, a test class is named with a 
underscore test class at the end okay so um, so create a test class called class important underscore test class and inside of this class we're going to group all our test functions so we have test one and we're going to assert that it's true right I'm just gonna mark a test here and then I'm gonna write another test test 2 and assert that that is also true okay so another mark test so instead of marking each test function I can mark the class as so here uh, I can instead mark the class as important so at mark dot important right above the class definition and because I'm using the mark decorator I need to import it from pytest import mark okay so when you mark the class as important every test function within it is marked as important okay so I'm gonna try and do that with this file over here as you can see um, this was our previous test file where we marked our important tests as uh, smoke and we marked one of them as not important okay so I'm gonna delete the smoke tests and I'm going to create a class called smoke underscore test class because that's the way you define a class okay and and I've pasted all the smoke tests inside the class and now I'm going to remove the marks and put it above the class I don't need to mark every single function so this is just me showing you what the previous file would what this file would look like if I convert if I grouped everything into a single class okay so I'm marking the smoke test class as smoke so that means every single test function inside of this is now a smoke test okay and I can run the smoke test and it will run every single test function within it right so that's all about markers so far you saw me mark your tests with whatever label right I called it I, I could mark my tests as smoke I could mark my tests as important not important um, but there are certain markers which are pre-built um, that do something right so we already came across one of those parameterization right if you remember at mark dot parameterize allows us to uh, do parameterization you know what parameterization is right creating variables and passing multiple inputs into those variables so that we can avoid writing multiple test functions right so that is a pre-built marker that does something right it's a it's a feature it does something so in the next video I'm gonna cover some of the pre-built you know the pre-made markers that do something in the previous video we marked our tests uh, with whatever label we wanted however there are some predefined markers uh, defined by pytest which does some work so I'm gonna cover what those predefined markers are and what they do so for this I'm going to create uh, a completely I'm gonna delete all these tests and create a completely new test file and I'm gonna do that within the test folder okay so so right click on the test folder new file and we're going to create a new file where we are testing the inbuilt markers right the predefined markers dot py okay so imagine that we had a test so let's define a test function def test underscore uh, whatever okay and this test for some reason fails so to simulate that I'm going to assert false okay and the F is capitals okay let's run the test open the terminal control tilde 
uh, pytest-v and sure enough it fails okay so if a test fails what you can do is you can skip the test using the skip marker okay so it's a predefined pytest marker which does something and what does it do it skips the test and moves on to the uh, next test okay now the mark decorator needs to be imported so from pytest import mark and you need to import mark right so from pytest import mark and now if i run the code open the terminal pytest v it says that this test function called test underscore failed skipped so it gives me a heads up that you skip this test and next to the skipped alert uh, it says that it's unconditionally skipped so if you want you can also give a reason for why you skipped the test okay by by doing this within brackets you can create a reason reason is equal to whatever reason you can put that in a string right so double quotes And the reason could be because the test deprecated. So let's clear the screen. And if I run the test again, pytest-v, you can see that next to the skipped alert for our test function, you can see that our test function again skipped, but this time it gives us the reason, right? It also tells us the reason for why we skipped the test. Okay, this test has deprecated and this is good documentation for future people that work on the code okay usually the case is whenever you run a test right it either passes or fails right but when you skip a test and if everything else works right every other test passes the test suite as a whole passes okay so let me give you an example I'm going to create one more test. Okay, this time this test function passes. Okay, so I'm going to assert true. I'm going to clear the screen in the terminal. And I'm going to run the test one more time. pytest-v. And you can see that uh, while the first test skipped, the second one passed, which means all the other tests passed. And so the test suite as a whole passed. Okay, sometimes your test might be a passing test, okay, it, it works most of the time, but it doesn't work for specific conditions. Like maybe your code will work in Windows, but it's not going to work in Linux. Or maybe your code will work in Firefox, but it won't work in Chrome. Or your code might work for Python, uh, for Python 3, or it might not work for um, the lower version, right? Maybe Python 2, it doesn't work. So if your test fails in specific conditions, you can mark those tests as conditional skips, right? You can conditionally skip them. You can mark your test as skip if. You can skip the test under specific conditions. And let me show you how to do that. All you have to do is change the skip marker to skip if right and then you give the reason the condition for which you want to skip the test and let me just change the name of the test this time it's a conditional fail and that means it fails in specific conditions and so you're asserting that it is true in fact it's not a failure you're asserting that this test is actually passing but not passing in certain conditions okay and the condition for it to not pass is um, sys.platform so let's say that your uh, it doesn't work for windows 32 right it doesn't work for 32-bit windows so then you type sys.platform equal to equal to 32-bit okay and you can also give the reason along with that for not passing or you know for why you for for skipping 
right? So the reason will be it's not Windows compatible, Windows 32 compatible. So uh, just like before, you have a test which fails, okay? So let me just change the assertion to fail, okay? False. So the test is failing and because it's failing, um, I can mark it as X failed this time, right? And X fail stands for expected failure. Now, if I run the test, open the terminal, control tilde, pytest dash V to run the test, and, and it skipped the test. Oh, okay, I forgot to save the file. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, let's clear the screen and control s to save and now if i run you can see that my test function alerts me with an x fail alert what does that mean so you can see that in both x fail and skip we have a test function which fails and we're choosing to either skip it or x fail it and to just show you how similar it is let's say that uh, another test passes, every other test passes. The test suite as a whole passes. So let me show you this, um, def test underscore pass. We're writing another passing test this time. And this means that every other test passes. I'm gonna clear the screen for the terminal and run the test, pytest dash v. And you can see that um, the first one x failed, the second one passed. And so the test as a whole passed and that's why you see all the green in the output so x fail stands for expected failure that means that you expect that the output is going to be failing kind of similar to skip but the difference the main difference between the two is in skip you are not executing the test right you're just skipping it whereas in x fail even though you expect the test to fail you run it regardless so you're running the test it fails but you don't give the failure alert right because if you give the failure alert the entire test suite fails um, you just give it the x fail alert okay with where you say okay you expected it to fail okay so you can see that pass that skipping a test and x failing a test are almost the same things. The only difference is in X fail, you're executing the test. While skipping, you're not. Oh, and also to show you, you can also do conditional X fails, right? So let's say that you just within brackets next to X fail, uh, give the reason for which it is conditionally failing. So in this case, um, the Python version, and that is, uh, sys.version underscore info is greater than 3.7. So what this tells me, so um, you might not be able to tell, but sys.version info is the Python version. Okay. So if the Python version is above 3.7, then this thing is not going to work. Okay. And I expect it to fail because this test has deprecated. Okay. Okay, so two very similar markers. What's the difference? Now I'm going to talk about my recommendation on how to use skips and X fails. Okay, my personal recommendation for skipping a test is if the test does not work at all and it is never ever going to work in the future. Okay, because there is no reason for you not to run the test. Okay, unless you are 100% sure this code is not going to go forward, right? This code is now deprecated. It has no future. So that's the only case in which you don't bother running the test. So you can skip those tests, right? So you can mark them as skipped. Okay, and that is the only reason that you would want to skip a test. The exception being, there is one exception. Sometimes your code can crash the entire app. And so that is the only 
case in which you know I could see you use skip okay now you could argue that you can use skip in other cases but there's a huge problem okay and I'll talk about that in a bit but for now so this is my recommendation if you use skips for any other reason then it's going to be very unclear what's skipping a, you know when you get the skip alert what is happening right whereas if you stick to a specific rule like this one where you skip it only if you know it's completely deprecated it's gone we're never going to come back to this code again that is almost like documentation if you think about it you know what that test what skip what getting a skipped alert means okay this test is useless now and we're not working on this anymore my personal recommendation for using xfail expected failures is on code that you're currently working on but it's not um executing right it's not completed or you're working on it and you expect it to be uh, finished by the month end or something like that okay so you can mark those tests as x fail use a lot of people use the x fail marker to create tests that um give a failure output okay so you're testing failures as in you want the test to fail right and that is a good thing now you can write failure tests using the assert statement itself right you can assert that something uh you know that something failed and that can be giving us a passed uh, alert so you can adapt the normal assert statement to give you failure outputs right i mean give you passed outputs for failed results right you want something to fail so you can give a passed test for those um you know for those conditions right you can adjust the assert statement for that you don't have to use x fail okay now some people might argue to me um that that's not possible in certain conditions and that's fair play and that might be a fair argument um but my personal recommendation is to stick to uh, this rule of writing x fails for now what do you gain from writing pass writing skips and fails following this rule when you mark uh, tests as skipped or x fails for these specific conditions your output is kind of like documentation right when something is skipped you know that that skipped test is useless you're not going to be working on it whereas if something gives you an x fail then you know okay this is a priority i need to be working on this okay it's failing and i need to be working on this okay so it's kind of like giving you information about your workflow on what to uh, work on now the only exception again is if the there is some skip test which is breaking the entire app uh, in that case you can you know you want to prioritize that skipped specific skip test okay one final thing i want to mention is that skip test and uh, x fails well, the reason why we even why pytest gives you this is because it's a better alternative to commenting your code out if you comment if something doesn't work okay for whatever reason and you decide to comment the code out that's usually what what you would do in the past the problem then would be okay after a few after a few weeks you would forget about that code right and then you test the code and then you see that okay it passes and you move on right and then after a few weeks you think you'll work on those tests but you don't and then eventually you forget about it and in the huge code base this commented code might exist and nobody might pick up on that code okay so um commenting your code out and this can result in huge delays and huge bugs and when you come back you'll be like okay there was this stuff that i forgot to deal with and i might now have to change other parts of the code to um to make up for the failure right so 
So commenting out your code is the worst thing that you can do. Skipping and exfailing tests are probably what you want to do. And my personal recommendation is to skip the tests if they're completely deprecated and you don't expect them to work anymore and to exfail the tests that um, you're currently working on, right? Like it's failing, but it's failing because you're currently working on it or you expect to work on that code later on. And now for my final recommendation before we can end this video is if you are skipping a test or X failing a test, please make sure that you take those tests and put them in a completely separate branch. Okay. You don't want your bosses to see that the output of your tests is giving off, you know, other alerts other than passing other than pass alerts. Okay. When you remove and put them in a separate branch and then work on that separate branch, what you get is your test suite giving more and more pass alerts and it gives the impression that you're writing code which is stable and you're writing tests which is you know giving more and more pass statements so it's good for you and it's good for the developers as well and good for the team as a whole you're basically trying to market your work as being of a good standard and that you're someone that you know people can depend on Again, this might not be possible in all companies, right? It might depend on company policy, but yeah, that's something I highly recommend that you do. Yeah. And that's, that's it. That's that. Uh, thank you so much.